Mel Hankler. We're at Mefford's Fort, or so the sign says right there, in historic Washington, just right down the road from Maysville. Once I read uh, the book by Alan Eckert, the who's a friend of yours. Yep, the Frontiersman. Uh, you know, it really, you really get a sense of pride and you, you think about the huge amount of history that's right here. As we left the last segment, we were talking about rifles. Now, I think we had a, a 58 caliber, maybe, okay. and maybe a 45 and a 32 and had different stuff, but we didn't really go into the history of the rifles that much. Now, I want to get specific on some rifles and the evolution of, of the rifle. Can you okay. tell us how, how it all started? Well, one of the, one of the misnomers of, of our world is this thing called the Kentucky rifle. Right. Uh, there really wasn't a whole lot of them made in Kentucky. It, it had its origins in Pennsylvania. Uh, there's some argument as to where, but probably Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. Uh, and I think a lot of that had to do as, as the people got off of the boats. These people, guns had been illegal in Germany and England where all of the immigrants were coming into America, but all of a sudden they needed a firearm to protect themselves and more importantly, to feed themselves sure. at that time. And going back to this whole statement of the Kentucky rifle, mm -hmm. the reason that it was called that is it was where they were being used not where they were being made. The whole world was a buzz about Kentucky, and it was because people could come here and they could, came, they could claim land. After you've studied them for a while, you can pick up a gun and a lot of times tell within 10 or 15 miles of where it was made and within four or five years of when it was made. Um, and, and a good example of that is, is this rifle. It's signed John Shriver. And the butt of this rifle is a little over two inches wide. And that's a sign of a real early firearm. Now, we know when John Shriver worked, but more than that, from the architecture of this gun, we realized that this gun was made in Adams County, which was originally York County, Pennsylvania, before Adams was, was divided out. Uh, but we also know that it was made either during or a little bit previous to the Civil War or the Revolutionary War. Um, a, a great thing that's happened in my research in the last four or five years, I started seeing some similarities. Um, I discovered a couple of brothers that moved in to, uh, to Kentucky real early. Uh, one, uh, Michael Humble, H-U-M-B-L-E, come in with George Rogers Clark to Louisville, and he's given credit to having the first gun shop in Louisville. And his brother, Conrad, now what year was that? Uh, 1774. He was actually with James Harrod when they settled and, and started Harrodsburg. But now his brother Conrad Humble in 1793 moved in to near Ruddles Mills in Bourbon County, Kentucky, just outside. But as I was doing this research, I, I kept pouring through the books and seeing different architectural similarities. And I kept seeing in this particular rifle, which is by Jacob Sell, again from York County, I start, kept seeing similarities of this particular rifle with the two rifles that we know that were made by the Humble brothers, mm -hmm. Conrad and Michael. And I dug a little deeper and found out they were first cousins. Well. So I dug this rifle out and then what I was able to do is once that I had this rifle, I could put these two together and by comparing the trigger guards have been cast out of the same casting. Boy, they look pretty similar, don't they? The thimbles have been filed in the same manner. I was able to build a real good case, if you will, that Jacob Sell was the apprentice of John Shriver. Uh -huh. Because now this gun is dated uh, 1786, so it's about 15 years newer. And if you'll notice, now the butt is not hardly as thick. Mm -hmm. But then that moves us on further. But this is a rifle by, by Henry Peter Mock. He was a brother to one of Kentucky's real well-documented gunsmiths, Daniel Mock, that first moved in to Ruddles Mills, again, in Bourbon County, then went on to Washington County, Springfield, Kentucky. And he, had a, he fathered a whole group of gunsmiths. How many, how many guns might these guys pump out in a year? And I'm thinking maybe five or 10. And you say? Uh, probably in a year's time, maybe as many as 30. 
Yeah. Uh, I, I'm going to say like maybe one every two weeks or three weeks, depending upon the amount of, of craftsmen or gun makers that was working in the shop. Because it was kind of a, a little cottage industry. Uh, there were very few people that was building them all the way from scratch. What was the predominant caliber? A lot of it's got to do with when they were made. Mm -hmm. Because if it, they were made before 1790, when there was still elks here in the state of Kentucky, lots of deer, big buffalo. So predominantly these were made to hunt and to protect. That's right. But after 1800, when all of that disappeared, that, that average caliber that might have been 55 or 58 drops down. And there seems to be a caliber here in Kentucky. So many of them are 42 caliber. Hmm. Don't you look at each one of these and wonder what this gun saw, who it might have shot, what it might have shot? The Scaring stories, the stories that, that these guns could tell if they could talk. Yeah. Let me ask you this. A lot of people are going to watch and say, what's a gun like this worth? What would you have to pay for a gun like this? They vary as much as an antique car. You know, you might be able to, to find one that's, that's had a little work done on it and, and it's going to range in the $3,500 category. But then the sky's the limit. Now, I believe, is this it? It is. Yep. This is the one you made. It is. Yep. Beautiful. Now, I, the obvious question I had, now, if I was to make something like that, it would take 122 years. Well, how it took me about that long. No, it didn't. How long did it take you to make something like You know, that? in all honesty, I worked on this gun over three years. Now, you know, I wasn't going to the shop and working on sure. it every day. You know, I'm, I'm not that kind of a, of a gun maker. Uh, but, you know, I've probably over 400 hours. Wow. I could see how this could get in your blood. And, and just every rifle has its own story, its own history, its Absolutely. own look. Are you, are, are you still on the look? Everywhere you go, do you stop by uh, antique stores or... Um, I really stay so in debt <laughs> <laughs> trying to buy these things. And, and these old rifles are like good violins or good fiddles. Right. They've been collected up for years and years. And it's a really, really rare thing for a great rifle to come out of a family. If they can only tell us, if they can only talk to us. Scare you to death. Thank you so much. Yes, sir. We appreciate you.